Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sachin from the ZKP2P team. We have very limited time, so let's get started. So ZKP2P is a trust-minimized fiat to crypto on off ramping protocol. It has a rather simple construction. You have the seller which locks their assets in the escrow contract and also provide an option identifier. Uh, the buyer then sends an option payment to that identifier and then generates a proof of the payment and sends that to the verify contract. Uh, if the proof verifies, then the verify contract unlocks the assets to the buyer. Uh, currently, we use payment confirmation emails and the ZK email library to generate proof of payment. And we have integrated with three payment services and done over 50K in volume over the last four months since our launch. Uh, but one question that we keep getting asked is when Euro? And trust me, we have looked at several payment emails for a potential Euro integration. But one blocker that we have hit consistently with uh, the Euro integration, as well as other integrations, is that payment emails aren't data rich. Uh, for example, this is a screenshot of a wise payment confirmation email uh, for a transaction that I sent to Richard. You can see that there's the amount, there's currency, but there's no unique identifier uh, of the receiver. Instead, you have Richard's name, which is not enough to generate the proof of payment. Uh, same is true for PayPal as well. Uh, in contrast, it turns out that websites and APIs are very data rich. So this is a screenshot of the transaction details page on the WISE website uh, for a transaction that I sent to Richard. Again, you see the name and uh, the amount on the page itself. But you look, if you look under the hood, you see an API response with a ton of transaction-related data, including a unique identifier for the receiver. Now, the question is, can we generate uh, a proof of this API response. Uh, for that, we'll need to understand, like dive deeper into TLS. Uh, TLS secures all the connection on the internet today. It is generally called the S in HTTPS. And you have two parties in TLS, the client and the server. The client sends the request encrypted using the client secret key to the server. The server responds uh, the response with encrypted using the server secret key. Now, let's say if you want to forward this encrypted response to a third party verifier. Uh, to convince them about the authenticity of the server response. Unfortunately, you can't do that because TLS uses symmetric keys, which means the client also has access to the server secret key, and they can forge any arbitrary response using it. So there was a solution proposed uh, to generate TLS proofs uh, uh, a few years ago, and that uses 2PC, so we'll quickly understand 2PC. 2PC stands for two-party computation. It's a special a uh, specific case of multi-party computation. In 2PC, you have two parties. Both have their own private inputs, which they feed into the 2PC circuit to compute the output. Uh, there are multiple approaches to implement 2PC, including garbled circuits uh, and FHG. So coming back to the problem at hand, uh, in order to prevent the prover from forging valid responses from the server, we, what we can do is essentially compute the TLS session keys inside a two-party computation such that both the prover and the verifier only have a share of the client secret key and not the whole secret key. That means the prover can no longer forge a valid response from the server. And because neither of them have the whole secret key, again, for sending an encrypted request to the server, they need to come together and perform a two-piece encryption, uh, forward the encrypted request to the server, the server responds with another encrypted response, which the prover forwards to the verifier, essentially committing to the encrypted response. Now that the TLS session is over, the verifier can reveal their share of the secret key to the prover, and the prover can use that to decrypt the server response and then generate a, a ZK snark of valid encryption and decryption and send that to the verifier. If the proof verifies, then the verifier is convinced about the authenticity of the response. This protocol is called the 2PC TLS protocol. Uh, it is an interactive protocol. And for the purpose of this talk, it can largely be considered as a, as a black box. So as I said, like the 2PC TLS protocol is an interactive protocol. So in the cases where you have a non-interactive verifier, for example, uh, a smart contract deployed on-chain, in, in the case of ZKP2P, you have to outsource this 2PC TLS verification to a third-party uh, verifier called a notary. Uh, the prover and the notary run the 2PC TLS protocol, and at the end of the 2PC TLS verification, the notary returns an attestation on the transcript of on the session transcript, which the prover can then forward to the verifier. The verifier just verifies the signature uh, of the notary on that, like 
essentially verify the registration, and if that passes, then the verifier is convinced about the authenticity of the response. Uh, this flow has been implemented by the TLS notary team. So now we have uh, a protocol to generate TLS proofs, and that means we can use that in ZKP2P to generate proof of payment. And in our case, uh, the buyer would be the prover, and they would run the 2PC TLS verification along with the notary. But as always, there's a catch. Because we are outsourcing the 2PC TLS verification to a third party, the, uh, the notary, the notary can, a malicious notary could collude with the prover and generate a fake proof of payment, one that did not actually happen. Uh, and uh, that's obviously bad. And to solve that, the one solution is to make the seller be the notary. And a rational seller would not obviously collude with the prover because it's their assets that are at stake. But then that introduces another attack by a malicious seller. After they receive the off-chain payment, they can essentially turn, like shut down the notary and refuse to notarize uh, the request. That means the prover will no longer be able to generate a proof of payment and unlock their assets. So uh, also, like, there's no way to prove that the seller is offline, so we cannot punish them for that. So the only way out is to introduce a fallback notary. And because we do not like centralized servers, we will have to introduce, like, because centralized servers could collude, uh, we will have to introduce a decentralized network of notaries with an honest majority trust assumption. But the UX in that case is very bad because essentially you will have to run the 2PC TLS uh, verification protocol with a majority of the nodes, majority of the notaries in the network. And for that, the prover would have to remain online for a very long duration, run the 2PC TLS verification with each one of them, which is very bandwidth intensive and very costly. So to solve all of the problems that I described before, uh, collusion, censorship, as well as uh, bad UX, we came up with the optimistic notarization flow. Uh, in this flow, first of all, the seller is no longer the notary. Instead, you have a dedicated network of operators acting uh, as the notary, and each one of them has a stake on the network. So any one of these uh, notaries is randomly selected for the notarization, and we optimistically assume that uh, the notarization is correct, there was no collusion, and unlock the assets. Uh, first of all, there is no more censorship because, let's say if the chosen notary refuses to uh, notarize, you can always just request another notary. Um, also, this is uh, good UX because essentially you're running the 2PC TLS verification with just a single notary, and that is uh, cheap. Uh, also, optimistic notarization works because we have this another party, the seller, which is incentivized to initiate the arbitration process if they find a discrepancy. And arbitration would involve uh, getting a majority uh, of the stake in the network to disagree with the initial notarization. So for on-off ramping, that would mean the seller proving that uh, the seller did not receive the off-chain payment that the buyer claims to have sent. If the initial notarization uh, is found to be wrong and then that particular malicious notary is slashed, and the slashing amount is used to compensate both the seller and the network. Now, arbitration is still very inefficient, but what we have done by like introducing optimistic notarization is essentially uh, increase an economic slashing, which deters the notary from acting maliciously in the first place. So that would this is very similar to this is very similar to optimistic rollups and. Uh, we expect arbitration to not happen in 99% of the cases. And there is precedence for that. For example, uh, till date, there has only been one fraud proof submitted on all optimistic rollups. And that too was on the proof of work folks, not, not on the mainnet. Uh, finally, the privacy of data is maintained uh, from the notaries due to the 2PC TLS protocol. So the optimistic notarization flow can be generalized to an optimistic Oracle network for private data. It works in a P2P setting where you have this other party constantly checking whether the optimistic notarization happened correctly. And this allows us as a team to go beyond on-off ramping. It allows us to build on-chain P2P marketplaces to trade all sorts of Web2 private data. Uh, the network could potentially be bootstrapped using Eigenlayer. Uh, finally, coming back to the original question, when Euro, 
soon we are in the final stages sorry we are in the final stages of our wise integration using tlsn uh, we will also be releasing the zkp2 extension along with the launch uh, in the initial launch we will be using a centralized notaries centralized notary and uh, all that all everything that i have proposed is essentially like down the line maybe somewhere uh, a year down the line also we have an in person demo so reach out to me if you need an in person demo finally uh, thanks to the tls notary team uh, for building tlsn also shout out to pse for sponsoring us the zk email team as well as uh, the tls notary team and uh, thanks to all of you for listening great i think we have a couple of minutes for questions yeah go ahead yep so um, if you have a question there are some mics on the chairs if you just press the on button then we should get you one two oh yeah cool um so correct me if i'm wrong but you in using this tlsn you're querying vices api and you are finding a uh, user id of the people who are sending you money and you are making some proofs based on that data and so what happens when the what happens in the protocol when the either API structure is changed, the JSON is changed, and it's not being able to parse using some regex that you have pre-written. So a drastic change to it. And what happens when the uh, key of uh, a TLS key of the party, of, uh, when the TLS key of Vice is expired, when they're renewing it, the public key? So yeah, that's a very good question. Like, Changing of templates is, uh, was a major problem in ZK email. For example, earlier we were using emails to generate the proof of payment, and uh, it's highly likely that a template of an email changes compared to what we are proposing right now, which is using TLSN. Now, APIs are generally backwards compatible, as in whenever an API changes, like you, like Wise would generally give like a maybe six month duration. They will make you aware of like the change, and whenever they introduce like a new API, like a V3 API, over a V2 API, the V2 API is not, um, I mean, it's not put out of production immediately. Uh, it's not deprecated immediately. You have like a good enough uh, timeline to uh, essentially update to the, to the new API. So that, I think, answers the first question. Is this, what was the second question again? The second question is when Wise renews the public key. Yeah, so if, if Wise renews their, so, what like during the 2pc tls verification we are verifying the two things one is like that the session ha happened correctly and the second is was the session was with wise and not with let's say wise uh, fakewise.com and there we are verifying the tls uh, key of wise and i believe tls keys don't change very regularly like once you are uh, essentially like you generate a tls key there's a like it stays the same for, for a very long duration. And if it is changed, it, I mean, I, I believe you are made aware of that, but I, I'll look into it, yeah. It uh, yeah, yeah, and a quick follow up. You mentioned that API, you would be notified if the API of Vice is changed. So you are using a public API, it's not a scraping of the API which is used on the HTML page. For Vice, we are using a public API. Uh, there could be also like, for example, if we, let's say if we integrate with a banking website, then we will have to scrape, uh, let's say if the bank does not have an API, then we'll have to scrape the HTML response. And that has a higher uh, likelihood of changing on the fly, right, compared to an API. Oh yeah, cool, thank you. Great, thank you. If you just turn that mic off on the little button, that'd be great. Um, I think that is all have we, we have time for, but if you have any more questions, if you just find uh, Sachin afterwards, that would be great. So uh, lovely, thank you very much.